Hello, hello, and thank you so much for joining us for Unexplained is Unacceptable, Searching for Answers and Making Peace with the Unknown, presented by President and Co-Founder of Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Association, Megan Hansen. Megan is going to talk to us about navigating her diagnosis of recurrent miscarriage and her decision to start Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Association in order to find better answers and treatments for families in this community. This is an important conversation to be had for sure. So my name is Lynn Poland. I am the co-founder of Kindred Beginnings, a family building support community, offering a safe, brief space for those navigating the journey to be supported, heard, and validated. If you have any questions about our programs or how we can help better support you, please reach out to me or visit our website. So again, Megan Hansen is the president and co-founder of Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Association, RPLA. They are a nonprofit organization dedicated to eliminating recurrent pregnancy loss through the advancement of research, to providing support and resources to those affected, and to increasing awareness of the impact of miscarriage and fertility challenges on women and families. Megan's professional experience includes healthcare marketing and nonprofit management. She holds a BS in biomedical engineering from Duke University and an MBA from Kellogg School of Management. She started RPLA in 2019 after her own experience of multiple miscarriages. Megan and her husband live in Seattle and they just recently welcomed a daughter in 2021 with the help of a gestational surrogate. You can learn more about Megan and her work by going to the RPLA website and following RPLA on social media. And you can also check out her fantastic personal blog, Misbehaving Uterus. And I love that. I laugh every time I, I say that. So welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us today and to lead this difficult and necessary conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for inviting me to talk to your membership during October, which is in, uh, Infant and Pregnancy Loss Awareness Month. Um, so, and and yeah, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share. I, I also want to start by just saying, you know, as always, I'm sorry if you're watching this. I, I commend you if, if, you, if you are going through uh, dealing with infertility or recurrent pregnancy loss, I, I am so sorry. And I, and I also commend you for finding Lynn because um, I think that that already shows that you're sort of taking steps to manage your mental health, which I think takes such a huge hit through this process. So um, I appreciate you listening and um, I'll go ahead and get started. That was a like beautiful intro. So I can <laughs> sort of breeze through some of my <laughs> early slides, um, but just a, a bit about me. So I, it's funny whenever I introduce myself, I live in Seattle. I've lived here for four years, but I'm always like, but I'm not from Seattle. I'm from Chicago. It's like, I'm still a little bit unwilling to claim the Pacific Northwest. I'm like, I'm a Midwest girl. So um, I'm from Chicago area. I currently live in Seattle with my husband who has been my partner in crime through all of this experience. Um, and as Lynn mentioned, we, we were blessed to welcome our daughter earlier this year with the help of an absolutely angel of a gestational carrier. So that was, I, and I'm, I'm always happy if, if people have questions about that, um, that can be a really tough decision. So at the end of this, if, if anybody has questions, I'm really open with the journey or you can, you can email me. I, I can talk at length about that decision. Um, but uh, before we had our, our baby, and as we were coming off of these years of infertility and loss, um, we started Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Association. And, and Lynn shared the mission right at the front, but I'm going to hit it again. The mission is really to eliminate recurrent pregnancy loss. And we do that um, by trying to be an organization of families who have experienced this that's really focused on advancing science and research so that we can find better answers. Uh, also, we provide support and resources, uh, information, things like that. I'll talk more about our programs at the end uh, and, and work on increasing awareness in general of the impact of miscarriage and infertility on families. Um, so what I, th this presentation is actually a bit of a derivation of a presentation I gave to a group of scientists at the NIH earlier this year. Uh, obviously, when I was talking to them, I was it was it was a, it was a different audience and a different um, I don't know tone of conversation. So I'll be a little bit um, I, I want to be a little bit more intimate with with talking to to you all who have more experience with this. But I do want to explain my journey so that you know sort of where I'm coming from and and what I went through. Um, so my husband and I started trying to build our family in 2015. Um, we got pregnant really quickly, uh, and we were 
thrilled as I'm sure you can imagine, you know, we did all of the things that somebody does early in a pregnancy. I started taking, well, I had already been taking, but I like really started taking all the prenatal vitamins and supplements to make sure that I was going to have a healthy pregnancy. I downloaded a baby tracker app and like every day I would open the app and look at how the baby was developing and what stage we were in and what organs might be, you know, starting to grow and things like that. I immediately, this was our first pregnancy we found out in early March. So immediately I'm starting to think about what's going to happen later this year. What are my holidays going to look like this year? Um, what trips do I maybe need to like cancel or readjust? Like, could I attend that wedding in October? How big was I going to be at that point? Like all of this happens immediately. And then when we got to our eight week appointment, we found out that the pregnancy had stopped progressing and all of that came to a complete crashing halt. And then we heard what I am sure that anybody on this call that has experienced loss, we heard very similar things that what other people hear. We heard, geez, I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, this is really common. Most likely there was something chromosomally wrong with the embryo. Best thing you can do is try again. And I list these because like all of these things are true. Unfortunately, miscarriage is very common. And most likely it is because there's something chromosomally wrong. And it is the best thing to try again. This is what's said. None of this is helpful in the moment because in the moment you're experiencing a significant amount of trauma. Like you don't care that this has happened to a whole bunch of other people. You care that it's happening to you. And you're not thinking about trying again. You're thinking about tending to your broken heart. Um, so these platitudes were not really helpful. But after some months of healing, we did try again. And again, we got pregnant really quickly. Um, we did all the same things. We, you know, I re-downloaded the app, which I had deleted off my phone. I restarted thinking about all of these. But this time there was something else that happened uh, at the same time. And that was an incredible amount of fear and anxiety because now the presumption was not that the pregnancy would necessarily progress, but that something could go wrong. And so I was very, very anxious. Um, some of you may have seen, there was an article that came out, I think in early 2020, it was a study that had been done in the UK, which showed that after pregnancy loss, a significant amount of women experienced PTSD, anxiety, depression, What's interesting is that these symptoms often lasted up to nine months after the pregnancy loss, and they didn't continue the study, but I anticipate that probably even longer. Um, what this tells me, looking back, is that like I was, I personally was clearly dealing with some of these very real mental health challenges, even as I began my second pregnancy, and that made it much harder to be kind of grounded in the experience. And then when that pregnancy also ended in a loss, it felt less surprising. It was like, well, this is what I expected to happen. We heard similar but slightly different things this time from our doctors. The good news is you're getting pregnant. That's good. You know, you're getting pregnant. That's a positive thing. No, we don't really recommend testing the miscarriage tissue uh, until you've had three losses. And the tests are usually inconclusive anyway, because usually this really is a chromosomal thing. Again, the best thing you can do is try again. There's probably nothing wrong. This is just, a, this is just bad luck. Unfortunately, you got two bad rolls of the dice. So pretty dismissive about there being anything that needed to be looked like lifting up the hood and looking deeper at what might be going on. But we listened to our doctors and we tried again for a year. And this time we did not get pregnant. So after a year of trying and failing to achieve a pregnancy, we enlisted the help of some specialists. Um, and so I like to call this next phase the phase of needles, pills, and surgery. Um, I had not, the, the big guns had not been brought out yet. I hadn't started the IVF process, but this was like sort of the phase of medication. So I was taking all the pills. I mean, 
I mean, I could list them. I'm sure you all know, you know, you're taking more pills than your 90 year old grandma. You're sticking yourself in your stomach multiple times a day. This is not a picture of my own medications, but this is a picture of my abdomen because the Lovenox or the heparin shots that I was taking left these like glorious bruises all over my belly. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, it just makes you feel like a bit broken every time you take a shower and look in the mirror. We got pregnant two more times with these medications and we lost both of those pregnancies. And what I have tried to kind of show with this weird pink roller coaster is that um, my level of excitement, which with each pregnancy, um, decreased over time. There was less and less excitement and sort of more and more sadness when the same thing kept happening over and over again. Around this time, we moved from Chicago to Seattle. And so we enlisted the help of a new fertility specialist, and she suggested that we try IVF. Her thought at that point, which is, I think, the situation that some of us get to when we've had multiple losses is, well, you know, you didn't actually test any of your prior pregnancies. Maybe you just have really poor egg quality or there's something going on with sperm. Let's do IVF. Let's genetically test the embryos. Let's make sure that we're implanting perfect embryos. We know you can get pregnant. Maybe this will fix the problem. So we did that. We went through the IVF process. We got pregnant two more times. I, we were a little more excited because we we're like, yes, we're doing something. We know that these are gonna be great little embryos. Um, again, like I said, pregnant with both transfers and lost both those. And after, the, um, after our sixth loss, we just couldn't keep riding this ride ourselves. Um, it was just too much. And so in 2019, after that sixth miscarriage, we stopped trying um, and started pursuing gestational surrogacy. So I've sort of talked a little bit about what this felt like, but I will talk a little bit more um, in detail because if some of you are in the same space that I am, I want to hold, hold that for you know what you might be experiencing as well. I felt an incredible amount of loneliness. Um, I, there, was, there was nobody else in my, I, I had not found a community like Lynn has created. I was not going to support groups. There was nobody in my circle of friends that had gone through this experience of recurrent loss. And so I just felt completely alone. Uh, moreover, my husband was, dealing with his grief differently than I was. And um, that also made us feel disconnected and even more isolated from one another because we were sharing this experience of grief together, but, it, but having that experience very differently. I was totally frustrated. Um, the reality is that 50% of recurrent miscarriage cases are medically unexplained. Which means like, you know, we, we had tried sort of all, we tried some experimental procedures. We tried some very vetted procedures. Nothing worked. Um, I remember talking to my doctor and saying, hey, if we try again, is there anything that we might do differently to try to expect a different outcome? And she said, I mean, I, I applaud her for saying this, but she was like, you know, I don't think so. You can certainly try again. I certainly believe that your body is capable of doing this, but I think what's going on with you, we just don't have the science to explain why this is happening. That's really frustrating. I felt completely broken. Um, as I think any person that has gone through an experience for current loss or infertility, it's like, we all, we're, you know, when we're little girls, we're like, this is what our body's supposed to do. It's supposed to, we're supposed to be able to like get pregnant and be moms. And when your body can't do that, there is a sense that like something has, that there's like this personal failing that your body is not doing what it was created to do. It feels very, felt very broken. Um, and it's exhausting. Um, I read, uh, some statistics that the like sort of trough in um, in the infertility kind of spectrum happens around two to four years in that I think that people just in general can like continue to work 
or like continue to like pick themselves up and get excited and um, motivated to keep trying for a period of about two years. And then if you keep going, it's like our minds just can't stay engaged that long. Um, and it's exhausting. Um, and the last one is afraid. Um, as, as, as many of you know, right, your, your vision for your family is sort of part of your, your core value system. You know, I had a really hard time and worked really hard, like in conversation with my husband to think about, well, what would life maybe look like if this doesn't work out for us? How do we, how would we maybe envision a whole and complete future without children in it? Because we were really afraid that we would never have that experience. Um, and that, it, that is a really hard place to be. Um, I think, it, and I, and I just want to say, say that, like, it, it is hard and, and you should honor the challenge of going through that process with your partner as you think about what might your family look like. I say all that, and then that brings me into starting the organization because I don't think it had to be that way. Um, when I look back over this journey, I, and I, one of my board members hates the word journey. I use it maybe because I don't have another word that's better. Um, but journey kind of indicates a start and a stop. And I don't know that that's how I would characterize this. But when I look back over this roller coaster, maybe, I really believe that it could have looked different. So I could have had a full RPL workup after my second loss. My doctors could have said, hey, you know, it, we don't need to wait till three. Let's go ahead and see what else is happening um, that may be contributing to this. And I might have avoided an entire year of trying to get pregnant and not being able to achieve pregnancy. I could have, there could have been improved diagnostics. You know, I had a lot of tests that came back where it's like, I didn't meet the threshold. I was sort of in a gray area. If there were improved diagnostics to maybe say clearly what was happening in my body, I might have been able to really decrease the burden of treatment and not have to take so many medications empirically. Like, well, we don't really know if this is happening, but why don't you just take this progesterone anyway? Why don't you just take this metformin anyway? Why don't you just take this aspirin anyway? Um, and I think that mentally having fewer medications that you're ingesting, like makes you feel a little bit healthier. I could have had any of my prior four pregnancies tested to see if chromosomal issues was really a problem for me. And had that been done, I might have avoided the cost, the physical burden, and the mental burden of going through IVF. Because as many of you know, that is an intense process that doesn't shouldn't happen unless it really needs to happen. And so, and the other thing I will say is that I could have been offered by my care teams like better grief support throughout this entire thing because I was very, very low, you know, and people would ask, but not really pry. I was never really, it was never really encouraged to take advantage of a lot of, you know, I proactively sought out like personal therapy and that was really helpful and I'm a huge proponent of therapy, but that came from me and not my care providers. And I think that, you know, care providers in general could have done a much better job like asking the questions and digging into my mental health throughout this process. And so when I look at all these things that like could have been different, that's really what is the mission behind starting this organization is like, how do I make sure that other people how do we, I shouldn't say I, how do we make sure that other families that are coming behind us have a better, don't have to ride this same ride, have a little bit of an easier time starting their family. And so I always say, Megan, like we're turning our pain into purpose. Yes. Exactly. Right. Like, like we experienced it. We don't want any other person to have to experience yes. it alone. Right. <laughs> There's something so amazing and special about a sense of community and resources and support. Yes, yes, I totally agree. Um, and so this is sort of my last slide before I open it up to questions. And, and I welcome any type of questions. Like I'm, I'm a very much an open book and share my opinions about all of this pretty freely. So anything is on the table. Um, but what the organization is currently doing, so 
actually was just announced last week. We have, we have a formal partnership with ASRM, which is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, to fund an annual research award for um, doctors or scientists that are specifically looking at causes or treatments for recurrent miscarriage. Um, and so that's going to be run through the ASRM Research Institute, but it's like a, a co-branded RPLA ASRM Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Research Award. So that's huge because it will allow um, people to, it will allow doctors essentially to, to pilot test these like hypotheses that they might had, have that they might not have funding available to investigate um, and hopefully get more people interested in trying to answer some of these questions. It's so awesome. I saw that. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Very excited about it. Huge. Yes. Um, in I, Target December, um, we will be launching a patient registry, maybe sooner if I can get some, get, find some more time on my end. But um, we'll be starting a patient registry. Um, a patient registry is basically just a, a big database. Um, so it will, individuals such as myself will be able to sign up. It's, it's, this is fully HIPAA compliant. Um, the, GD, GD, the global privacy protection, it's compliant. I, as the, like, we as RPLA never know who's in the registry or who's not. I never see anybody's information, but people that have experienced recurrent loss can go in and answer a series of surveys. Um, and then that data is available to try to analyze and find what might be happening to subgroups of people because recurrent pregnancy loss is a really um, heterogeneous, we're like a bowl of fruit, right? Each one of us looks a little different and because it's relatively rare, it can be hard to figure out, well, what's going on with all the apples and like what's going on with all the oranges um, and a registry can help facilitate some of those things. Um, we run a monthly peer-to-peer -peer support program. So not quite as elegant as the support groups that Lynn runs um, as, as a professional coach, um, but it is a peer-to-peer -peer support group for people that have had this experience of recurrent miscarriage and are really looking for others that share that particular experience. Um, we try to sit down with pregnancy loss experts to kind of dig into some of the unanswered questions around care. Uh, those live on our uh, Facebook page and Instagram page. And then lastly, advocating for better coverage. So I personally, and I encourage all my board members, just like Lynn does, to be really active state and federal advocates with Resolve. I will say, you know, Resolve has the advocacy machine really well running, and we do everything we can to support them in their efforts so that it's a lot easier for people to get treated. Yeah, work smarter, not harder. They have it all together. They have a toolkit, and it's exactly. super simple. You don't need any experience. Exactly. I am a very much of a, like, we don't need to be recreating the wheel in this space. We just need to be helping fill gaps and make connections. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about me, a little bit about what we do. Um, if you want to get more involved or you have any questions, um, this is my contact information. I have so much more to say on misbehaving uterus and I like have not had the time to sit down and write, but I have like a list of all of these blogs that I want, entries that I want to write. So <laughs> I have every intention of keeping that going, uh, but I have had a little bit of radio silence recently. Uh, but it's still understandably there. so. Understandably <laughs> so. <laughs> it just the heart just kind of shifts a little bit. So, <laughs> but if you have not been on misbehaving uterus, like there's there's just such um, a balance of uh, like knowledgeable tips and humor that's in there, and it's a really nice gentle balance. And it's just one of those things you're like, yes, somebody gets it. Thank you. Yeah. No. It, it's it's really well done. Um, Megan, I, you know, I know your story and every time I, I hear your story, um, ugh, my, my heart just like breaks a little bit more. And I'm saying that in a place of like empathy, not yeah. in a place of sympathy, yeah. uh, just, just to sit with you and just all, all of the yuck, because it's, it's so super hard. And 
you too are so courageous in honoring your truth and sharing your story, because that is how we shatter the stigma and shame around all of this. It's by being open and honest. And then, you know, it's a domino effect. Somebody else will say, oh, wow, me too. Yep. Let me share. And that that's how we get it. That's how we get the ball rolling. So um, I have some questions. I have some questions for you. Totally. Um, I know one of your, one of the pieces of your mission is to come up with better treatments and resources, right? Yeah. What would you say is missing from the medical community in terms of first support? Because you said like grief support, that, that really nice visual, right? Yeah. What, what, what is missing and why is it missing? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I, and and I, it was interesting. So I just did a podcast with, I just was on the ASRM podcast and my answer, because, because the guy that was the um, podcast host asked me like, what are some things that doctors can do to better care for, for their patients that are having this experience? And it's, I think that they're not asking enough, que enough questions around their patient's mental health. Um, it, because it's uncomfortable and gr grief is really uncomfortable. And usually you're sitting, you know, I mean, at least for me in my fertility clinic, I was interacting more with the nursing team, which they were lovely. And, and I think the nurses need to dig more into this as well, but it's like, I felt like so often I was dealing with my actual doctor, either in moments where we were going right into a procedure or in moments where like I had just experienced a trauma. And so it wasn't really the right time to have a honest conversation about what other support I might need. I think that that sometimes needs to happen um, as follow-up and like repeatedly as a follow-up. Um, that, that, that's, that's one thing I, I just, the, the, the fertility clinics are in a position to be monitoring what's, what's going on. And I think that sometimes if it's too much on the side of, well, we're just trying to solve your problem and, and we're trying to solve your problem. We're trying to get you pregnant. We're trying to get you a baby and then everything will be all right. No, like it's, it's leaving a whole lot of stuff on the table. Um, there was a, when I was at the conference, there was a, I, I was on this panel or not on this panel, I listened to this panel that they were discussing, they were discussing pre-genetic testing, but there was a geneticist and I loved what she said because she's like, you know, I think we sometimes have to remember that the goal of this is not to get people a baby. The goal of this is to end with healthy patients and healthy families. Um, and I think that some doctors are there and, and some doctors not quite there yet. So that, that's an interesting just kind of shift just in the language, right? Um, so really, it's just really providing people with the time and space that they need to, to grieve and to process. And as you were saying that, an idea popped into my head. So oftentimes somebody will have a failed cycle and they'll say, oh, my consultation to figure out what happened is in two weeks. And maybe what would it look like if that wasn't a consultation, if that was a support session, right? right? And not like, What's, what's the plan going forward? Because typically it's, oh, we don't know why it failed, right? right. I mean, and they have nice ways of saying that. Um, right. And here's the plan going forward. Here's the next protocol. When do you want to get started? And what if we just didn't do that right away and we just offer people the time and space that they need? Yeah. And sometimes they're like, you can take a break if you feel like you need some time and you're like, okay, but during that break, like that's the time that you might <laughs> need some support to like get a little mentally prepared to start again. You know, yeah, what, what do I do? What do I do during that break? Yeah. Um, and the second piece that I want to pull out of what you just said is there's a common misconception that once you are pregnant, everything will just be okay. Right. And as you were talking about your, your journey, like the first time you were pregnant, like this is great. This is great. But each time yeah. That fear creeps in, right? Like, what if, what if? And after every loss, I can only imagine that that gets more and more difficult and the anxiety um, is more and more present. So we have to keep in mind, and even if you're, you know, getting pregnant the first time and you're, you're having a successful pregnancy, getting pregnant, although the goal um, is still hard. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't all just go away. Your fears, your anxieties just shift a little bit. Yeah. And I totally, and the experience never leaves you. I, I think, you know, I was thinking about this recently. Um, 
too, that, you know, I was like, when do you, when am I, when am I resolved? Am I resolved now, now that we have, like, now that we have her, are we, are we resolved? Are we done? And I think like, you can, all of us get to make the decision when we want to, of when we're done building our family. Like, and so by that definition, like we get to decide when we're resolved from the phase of our life, when we're actively trying to create or grow a family. But this experience still has changed what my family will look like compared to what I imagined that it will look like. Yeah. Um, and so that, that change is going to continue on. Like this, this doesn't, this isn't, I'm in a different phase, but it's not like all this has disappeared. It, it, it doesn't negate your journey. It doesn't yeah. negate what happened. It doesn't ever go away because it's a trauma. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because all of it's a trauma. Um, I have one last question for you. In an yeah. ideal world, what would you like to see offered? For the, for the all of the community, what would what would be like the utopian? Yeah, you know, it's it's I I will for all of the community. I'm I won't answer that. I, I I'll answer this sort of for me and what I think for the recurrent loss community because I do feel like there are some nuances that are slightly different between the two, and I, I don't want to speak to an experience that I that I didn't live. Um, I think a couple things for recurrent pregnancy loss. I think number one, um, the, I would like to see more people evaluated earlier at the community health level. I think that, you know, I, I have an open question in my mind about when, you know, if and whether it was even necessary for me to transition to a fertility specialist, like a lot of the, a lot of the standard RPL workup, not all of it, but a lot of the standard workup can easily be done by an OB. And so I think that um, fertility specialists have expert knowledge in this space. And, and I, I will say I had really wonderful doctors. I know really wonderful doctors and they're giving excellent care to their patients. But also like there's a, there's a lot fewer fertility specialists than there are OBs. And so I think that when we talk about like access and, and kind of speed of treatment, there's probably more that can be done there. And then I'd also just really, I, I think you can't really get better treatment until you know why it's happening. There are, as I've, I'm not a scientist, but as I've talked to scientists, like there are a couple areas of reproductive medicine that do impact us all that are totally like black boxes. There is, there are tons of questions about how um, placentation happens that scientists are trying to answer and it's really hard for them to answer. Um, and there are a lot of questions that people are really trying to look at about um, genetics and genomics. Like basically, you know, like it's possible that there was something physical going on in like my endometrium or how my body was expressing things to allow healthy implantation to happen. Um, and it's also possible that there is some weird combination between like my husband's and my own genetics that is having this issue be really particular to us. And I think that's where some of the genetic science is, is headed to trying to answer those questions. And so um, I, I'm personally like, I'm interested in seeing what they find. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, for sure. And really it comes down to, you know, you said after the second loss, we could have gotten the whole workup. It comes down to advocating. Why does it need to be three? Who made up the number three, right? So always comes down to be your own advocate and put the ask in. And I think it's really interesting that you said that you know an OB is able to do the, that workup. I think that's that's a a good piece of information for people to know. Yeah, because a standard RPL workup is it's like a series of blood tests. So there's like a blood panel. It's a uterine cavity evaluation, which they can easily do in an OB office. It's um and then it's like genetic, I mean, they, they should be looking at your karyotyping to make sure that there's not like a translocation, either you or your, your partner. Um, and that can, that's just a blood test as well. Um, and that, and that, like, that's it. It's like, it's really looking at a bunch of, a bunch of blood panels and then doing like a physical, uh, uterine cavity evaluation. So, you don't need a, a specialist to do all of those things. Like you might, 
depending on what's found, you might need a specialist to help with some of the treatment, but, um, but for the workup itself, ask your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Megan, it is, oh, I always enjoy talking with you, speaking with you. You have such wonderful information to share. Um, you know, you spoke about the community I created. Thank you for creating this community specific for uh, those that are experiencing recurrent pregnancy loss, because although our communities overlap, um, they are different. They are, they are different. And so thank you for creating this really safe, brave space for um, the recurrent pregnancy loss community. Thank you. Take care. You as well.